I actually started doing my general nursing. I always wanted to be a nurse. I was interested in um, caring for people, didn't know what kind of nursing I wanted to be in. I always wanted to be a stoma care nurse, which was a nurse that looked after the bowel, always wanted to do that. Something happened and I just thought, oh no, I'd like to think about mental health, and I just came into mental health and just loved it, really. I did my basic training in India and did psychiatry there, and then came to UK and did psychiatry again. Um, so I've done quite a lot of psychiatry, I can say. You often see that the most stigmatised and vulnerable people in society never really get an even break or people don't really understand them. So what I've done over the past 20 odd years that I've been in the, in the NHS is, is try and help to make that better. I've worked for the NHS for 14 years and all I want is to want staff to want to come to work. You know, I feel like if people are happy in work, the more productive in work, the more effective in work, it's better for everybody involved. It's, it's a no-brainer. I had some friends that worked here. I applied for the job, got it, but didn't understand what I was getting myself into. Mersicare is a mental health and community organisation. Our catchment area is very wide in terms of the services that we provide, so we don't just provide it from one physical location, we've got over 70 geographical locations. Mersicare sits in the northwest of England. Principally, our focus is in and around the city of Liverpool. I love Liverpool. It's, it's a very friendly place. Just go in the streets and then there's the friendly smile that greets you. Even though it's a city, you've got the warmth of uh, a tiny village. I'm William James, and these are the girls, Jennifer, Debbie, Sarah, and Sue. Yeah, <laughs> Been here for 18 years. Our core in Mersey Care is behavioural health, from core talking therapies, out in communities, close to people's homes, right through to one of three high secure mental health hospitals. We see around 40,000 people a year, but that, given the nature of what we do, converts into well over half a million contacts every year. We are a mental health organisation, so we are about healing, especially the psychological trauma. We have a number of psychiatric units. Um, assaults happen um, because patients are uh, distressed and sometimes they communicate their distress through violence. I was a charge nurse and I've worked the majority of my career on high dependency admission wards which are challenging, busy, uh, quite often dangerous. I've come across many situations so nothing surprises me, nothing shocks me. you got people's lives in your hand and the slightest thing you can say or do can tip a balance either way. So looking at severe enduring mental illness and all of that entails, through to how to deal with what people might call mild to moderate, but which if unchecked actually can be hugely destructive for people's working lives, their families. It was a bit of an eye opener for me because I didn't have a great deal of understanding of mental illness and personality disorder. So when I seen them come in and they were in distress and, and patients thought things were crawling all over them and I see them now leaving the hospital, functioning day to day, it's, it's nice to see. We think very hard about our organisational performance because we're a publicly funded system and it's very important that we meet the obligations set off us from the, the, the people who fund us, which is the general public. But we've been looking at driving our performance more through the notion of organisational health. Are we well led? Do we have a good and clear strategy? But what sort of became obvious is that that stuff's necessary, but it doesn't really feel sufficient to, I think, get that that fantastic breakthrough moment that lots of organisations, I think, in healthcare are seeking. The surprise package out of it all for us was staff saying, but actually, you know, you can't seek that level of change, get that level of uplift, if we still operate inside a blame culture. And of course, naturally, we uh, scratch our heads and say, but we don't have a blame culture. There's 
at the time, the, the sort of the management culture was quite a, an intimidating kind of bullying management system and there was lots of, dare I say, corruptness going on. Coming into the health sector, you have to recognise um, um, how things work. It is a political system, it's target driven. We're working in an environment that is heavily undercut at the moment. So, you know, with lots of pressure from the government on, on a lot of the NHS trusts, um, it's just difficult all around. And I'd heard people tell me stories before about, you know, if you raise concerns, if you put your head above water, you'll be moved, or something, you know, you may be moved to somewhere else, you, you, your job might be in jeopardy, you just don't know, you worry. If I make a mistake, it's easier to suspend me and they've saved 20 odd thousand pounds a year in wages. It's just all money, it's all numbers. In a system as complex as the NHS, sometimes that ingrained culture and um, the nature of, of how it works isn't conducive to working in a just culture way. Probably about three years ago, we were going through a, an awful lot of cultural resistance and challenges and conflict, which had ended up in situations where we didn't want to be. Places like industrial tribunals, dismissing staff. But it was almost as if we felt trapped in that situation. I've been doing this job for a long, long time and we were following systems and processes, you know, best practice examples. And nor could I grasp the semantics to explain it. Sometimes the higher you go up the pole, the further you get away from some of the things that matter to the people who every day run your organisation. And then out of that tumbles the big conversation that, that for somebody like me at, at the head of the organisation starts to realise actually my perceptions and the perceptions of people who are in the service, actually those have to align really, really strongly. And, and I think there was a dissonance. Well, it was the 3rd of June 2016. It's a date that will never go from my head. I received a call from one of the senior managers asking me to go in and see her. I was met with um, HR and the senior manager and they said that I was suspended from duty. I was informed that there was allegations made against me and it started a journey which just created so much, so much damage really. So I was working on a ward, doing my job as a charge nurse. I alerted to a senior manager and my ward manager that just to consider the kind of constraints that we're all under. As I was thought doing my job, I have to report concerns from my staff and it was on sending that email that I then found out from my manager at the time that I was going to be moved. It didn't go down very well, I was very upset. And I rang HR the following morning and HR's response was, has, has nobody contacted you? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Has nobody rang you? I said, rang me about what, I'm coming to meet you. They said, no, you're actually under investigation and you've been taken off the wards. That was the first I knew of it. Yeah, so I was a ward manager, probably been a ward manager for about four to six months and it was brought to my attention that a student nurse that was on policement had raised some concerns via a university that involved two staff members that were on the ward I managed. Um, a meeting was held um, with a um, senior manager and um, a senior link person from HR and in my head there was an allegation there and it was sort of serious, semi-serious, um, but I wasn't sort of ready and expecting um, the response from, from the trust at the time, which was to, to suspend the staff. Um, so we spent about 20 minutes talking through the allegation. From that, I was instructed to link in with the two staff members' union representatives and ask them could they quite quickly be present while I uh, suspended them. It was probably all done within an hour, quite whirlwind, yeah. Well, I was working on, on an acute admission ward. It was tough. It was a tough job, probably the hardest job I've ever had. Without any real warning, a lady on, on my ward took her life. Then, three or four months later, a man took his life on another ward. There's three wards in the unit where, where we were working. 
and people started to get to be curious. There was some intrigue to think, well, that's two people have taken their lives, two different wards in the same unit in a short space of time. A month after the man took his life, another lady took her life on his mother ward, his third ward. There were three deaths, three separate wards, no real correlation or link between any of them. I was suspended for a year and the trust reacted in a way that I think now we look back on as, as probably not the best way we should have dealt with it. We employ currently around eight and a half thousand people. It's really easy when you're in our jobs, uh, when, when something hits the fan, to ask, I wonder who was at the back of that? The environment that our staff create for healing and the need for compassion, and our staff ooze that, but they don't always feel that from the bureaucracy that's associated with the sector that we work in. You get drawn to the people who are beyond you and the issues that they have that are beyond you. Our regulators, our performance managers and all of those things, they, they sort of slowly, without anybody thinking about it, feel like we've become, they're, they're our customers. And actually our customers are on the shop floor. I've been a HR director now for a number of years and I've always kind of thought I've been pretty okay at my job. You looked at the data on a piece of paper, you looked at the numbers as numbers and you go into a clinical environment and you watch and those numbers become people and those people become real situations and real interactions. I heard nothing for many weeks. I had various people ringing me saying, what, why are you off? I was trying to chase around, what, what am I meant to be off with? I was trying to sort of form some evidence for myself. I went home that night really distressed. You're almost like the person who's got the plague, who's sent outcasts and you feel like an outcast, you feel like a criminal. So I came into work and I wanted to come in just to show my face around, just to tell people this isn't right. It's difficult to know exactly at what point, but we've got to a point, certainly as a board and a team, that we thought we've got to change the way we do this. And people were being suspended, investigations were taking time, people f didn't feel confident actually that at the end of all that process we were getting to the root cause and actually understanding what had happened. I know we needed to change as leaders, but we needed somebody to hold our hand and guide us. I think we started the journey when Sydney Decker came to us and then talked about this culture. So after reading Sydney's book, I decided I had to find him. Thank you. Um, it, is, it is humbling and delightful and, and very inspiring to see an idea being turned into a reality. Th this is language borrowed from an airline in another part of the world that, oh no, we have a just culture, we just fire them. Um, <laughs> and so the real challenge is that you cannot buy a just culture off the shelf. It doesn't work that way. A just culture is not something that you have on the wall or on a PowerPoint slide. A culture needs to grow and germinate from within. Creating a just restorative culture is a hard and long slog. The day I was suspended was the worst day of my working life. The stigma, um, the, the credibility, professional credibility, um, my reputation within the organisation, knowing that people say, well, there's no smoke without fire. I, I'm not proud of it. I probably, I can't say at that point I should have done anything different because I didn't know how to do it differently. But I know, I know now that one of the staff members involved was in her last 12 months, having done 25 to 30 years service. And I know she left the organisation feeling quite bitter. You don't get credit sometimes for the difficult job that we do, and it's challenging. Sometimes it's bloody hard. And then my doing my job led to me to being in a position where I actually wanted to leave. Didn't want to come back as a charge nurse, didn't want the responsibility. 
I've been at the other side when clinicians have been facing disciplinary and thinking back, um, I think I could have been more compassionate. I remember my husband to come down the stairs, and this might sound really drastic and dramatic, but I had my life insurance policy out and I was looking to see whether, you know, if I wasn't here, would the family be better off? What's gonna, um, what's the best option for me to take? It was just the most horrendous time of my life and my family's life. When you spend time in an organization like this, you spend a lot of time in meetings and a lot of PowerPoints, a lot of presentations, and sometimes it almost feels as if they want to proceduralize and process compassion and relationships and trust, and you can't. And the great block in that is people's belief that, particularly if something goes wrong, um, we blame them, we blame them. We won't stand back and necessarily blame our systems and processes and all of those things, we blame them. Basically, at the end of the investigation, they came up with no case to answer. When I was eventually reinstated back to work, I was given a final written warning. And I was just told that the incident had been investigated and there was no case to answer to, and just to come back to work. We can sometimes think as an organisation that, well, that's finished now. But for many people, it, it, it hasn't finished. But when I came back to work on the 3rd of January, I was informed that I couldn't go back to the place where I used to work, that they would find an alternative job for me. There was various job offers offered at the time, none that I felt I had the right skills for. The staff felt like the two colleagues had been um, sort of proven guilty without trial as such. Everyone in the team looks at how their colleagues are being treated. So if you've got a whole team that really respects someone and then something goes wrong and then they don't feel as if that person's getting supported, it can, it can undermine the care that we're trying to give to the service users. You question your professionalism, everything you've learned, everything you've got about how well you bring it to the job was just gone in seconds. People carry that around in their daily work and it's important that when people work in an organisation they feel confident that there is support and there is a chance to talk through the impact of these often very long term, very personal and searching investigations. I fear that sometimes I'll go home and I'll go, have I done everything I need to do that day? My husband, even to this day, says this is a mental health trust. <laughs> yeah. It can't be the case that we are investigating things efficiently, finding things out and leaving people dissatisfied, leaving people with a sense that actually they need to move on and they can't. And it might depend on individuals, but I think we have to keep working at the right way to do that and learning from how others are doing that. But it is something we have to tackle, it's something we have to do better. When I read Just Culture, it just really made a connection with me personally, professionally. So there's really two ways in which you can do Just Culture. Right? One would be a retributive way, and you ask questions like what rule is broken, and, and, and how bad was it, and what should the consequences be, and it's all focused on the individual who's the supposed offender. Doing Just Culture restoratively asks three very different questions. It asks, who is hurt? What do they need? Whose obligation is it to meet that need? And then it considers how we can involve the entire community in that conversation, in that discussion about how to repair harms and how to address needs. That's how our staff felt. They wanted parity of esteem with how we treated our service users and our patients. But actually, as we started to explore the concept together and talk about it, it was then, well, do you think we should try doing it? I wasn't brave enough to say to the organisation we are going to try and implement a just and learning culture. We kind of went under radar with it a little bit to see can this work in practical terms. We announced that we were going to develop a just culture. And when I heard that, I, I, I felt almost insulted by the organisation that having what I felt like I'd been through, and it's about perceptions. I mean, some people in the organisation may feel that I was dealt with appropriately. I, I, I don't agree, I never will agree. I got myself an invite to the Just Culture Day, and my intention was to sit at the front and stare at Joe, and somehow maybe try and make him feel as uncomfortable as I'd felt for, for the previous 18 months about how my career had gone. 
I contacted the executive director, Amanda Oates, and I asked to go and meet her. I went to see Joe Rafferty and Amanda Oates, and I told them what I thought about the whole situation, about the corruptness, how I felt um, that there would be repercussions, that I felt scared to say anything. When I got into the main conference suite, and I was sat with Joe and, and with Amanda, and I felt quite intimidated then. I didn't feel like I was going to stare at anybody. Amanda listened, which was, which was helpful, um, because at that point, I don't think anybody had. You know, it's been not nice to have to sit in front of staff and hear the horrendous stories of how my organisation has treated them. I've had to accept that sometimes our very interactions, whilst they haven't been intended, have caused other people harm and hurt and pain. And that's actually extended into their families. They've seen them go through that hurt, harm and pain. And actually having real conversations with staff and listening to their real experiences when we haven't done things as well as what we wanted has been hard. She kept in touch. So even after being to see her, she dropped me an email to say, are you okay? When I sat there, I didn't feel like it was positive, but it was a very positive thing because conversations unfolded um, and Joe asked me, would I meet him in the new year? I think the main challenge for an organization like Mercy Care or any other is to see how they can start to meet hurt and harm caused in the execution of their duties, not with more hurt and harm, but actually go to a place where they can meet hurt and harm with healing. Amanda apologized on behalf of the trust. She thanked me because that was the only agenda I wanted to go with. The agenda when I met Amanda was to say, this is what I've been through. Um, and let's learn and move forward from this. And I got a letter of apology of Joe Rafferty and Amanda Oates for the way this was managed, that it was really badly managed and should never have happened. My vision really is that we, we rediscover as a healthcare provider the importance of a compassionate approach. We rediscover the importance of relationships. So I met with Joe and that's when he, um, we had our conversation. I told him how I felt and that was when he asked me to, to become part of the team. The concept of a just culture, which we've tagged into a just and learning culture, um, has become something that's really important to us. An incident is something you've already invested. What you need to do is get a return on that investment. A restorative just culture allows you to get that return, to learn from it, to not send people away who were involved in it, because they're actually the embodiment of the really expensive lesson that you're not learning. I think it's an expected part of change that um, not everybody will, at the same time will, will be as excited or as inspired by this process. Because if anybody had the right to be cynical about Mersey Care saying we're going to be a just culture, it's me. And I go around the trust, I, I meet people at induction, I do some training seminars, about, not necessarily about just culture because I'm not an expert in it, but it's something that I love. We need to work out the right way to do restorative justice. We've tried it in our services quite effectively. So one of the services in the Trust where there are assaults, um, there's a the process of bringing people together at the right time to, to talk through and to reflect. And it's a very powerful way of learning, very deep learning, and it's very personal, but it's a very effective way. I think we should be doing that with our staff groups. I was involved in a recent incident where I'd done something I don't hesitate to use the word wrong, but I'd made a mistake. And it was dealt with via the new Justin Learning culture. My manager sat down with me, went through the incident, discussed the, the um, contributing factors, and from that we're going to do a lessons learned. Because it's something that could happen to any of my colleagues who do the same job. Although I'd made a mistake, um, I wasn't felt made to feel that way. I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus on different areas or aspects of kind of, you know, uh, workforce, performance, etc. All these things are byproducts and positive byproducts of getting the culture right. So, you know, I'm saying let's not focus on sickness absence, let's focus on culture, and then we'll see a, an improvement in sickness absence. Or if we're talking about wanting our staff to be well, let's not kind of think about what we need to do to get them well. Let's change that culture behind it, and that will organically kind of grow. I don't know the numbers exactly, but I know that um, there's, a, there's a quite poignant graph. And I think that visual 
to people made a real difference. So in January 2016, in the local division, it shows that there was 23 cases where people were going through disciplinary procedures. Whereas if you look 12 months later, in January 2016, sorry, 2017, there was only 15, and then it comes into four in secure division. So it just shows the reduction. Medicare's attempt now to implement this is really groundbreaking. We actually keep the experience, we learn, patients will be safer, treated better, we all do well. What, what isn't there to get? I often get the question, Sid, what is an example of an organization that gets this, that does this really well? And you know, I've always been lost for an answer. I've always said, oh, there's pockets of excellence here and there, but a single organization that gets this, really hard to find. Look at Mercy Care, look at what these people are doing. Our staff are amazing. The respect, compassion, and the ability that they want to give our patients their lives back. I want to be able to do that for our staff. I was invited to our board meeting. I explained some of the stuff we're doing, a bit of an update to the board. It was a full board of our executive directors, non-executive directors, members of the public were present. And then the best bit of the story really is uh, that at the end of, of the presentation and the talk, there was a few pleasantries, a few questions backwards and forwards. And then Joe said, well, personally, and on behalf of Merzika, I'm sorry for the hurt that we caused you. I'm just an ordinary bloke who cherishes fairness and really sees the value of justness in, in, in a culture, certainly in employment. So I love what I'm doing, um, and, and I'm, I love being part of making Merzika a better place.